So the Aaron series aims to explore the, quote, critical potentials and risks of embracing error, randomness, failure, and non-teleological temporalities. Questions of error and failure have ruled over my intellectual life, explaining my interests in queer models of history, bad, minor, and ugly feelings, sexual and social deviance, and especially in the subjective effects of inequality, exclusion, and stigma. In an essay that I published in graduate school on the work of the novelist Radcliffe Hall, I quoted Eve Kosofsky Sedgwick from her essay, Queer Performativity, on the importance of shame for queer politics. Um, this will be a familiar quote to some of you, um, but I'll just read through it. What's the point of accentuating the negative of beginning with stigma, and for that matter, a form of stigma, shame on you, so un unsanitizably redolent of that long Babylonian exile known as queer childhood? But note that this is just what the word queer itself does, too. The main reason why the self-application of queer by activists has proven so volatile is that there's no way that any amount of affirmative reclamation is going to succeed in detaching the word from its associations with shame and with the terrifying powerlessness of a gender dissonant or otherwise stigmatized childhood. If queer is a politically potent term, which it is, that's because far from being capable of being detached from the childhood scene of shame, it cleaves to that scene as a near inexhaustible source of transformational energy. There's a strong sense, I think, in which the subtitle of any truly queer, perhaps as opposed to gay, politics will be the same as the one that Irving Goffman gave to his book, Stigma, Notes on the Management of Spoiled Identity. But more than its management, it's experimental, creative, performative force. Now the idea of beginning with stigma no longer seems as strange as it did in 1993, when this piece by Sedgwick appeared in the inaugural issue of the journal GLQ. In the past two decades, scholars in queer studies have thoroughly explored shame, as well as a range of other negative or politically unpromising affects. Failure, disidentification, depression, masochism, radical passivity, melancholy, shyness, self-divestiture, antisociality, cruel optimism, dispossession, vulnerability, the list could probably go on from there. Uh, when I originally read this passage back in 2001, I pointed to Sedgwick's affirmative reclamation of shame, her insistence that it was politically useful and that it was a near inexhaustible source of transformational energy and argued that in refunctioning shame, we risk forgetting what made it so powerful and so painful in the first place. I hear a similar concern in the project description for Aaron's, which points out the, quote, necessarily paradoxical nature of a, quote, critique of the ideals of productivity, success, goal orientation, and determination. Emphasizing the experimental creative performative force of shame or failure can be a kind of betrayal when it fails to grapple with the psychic, social, and material reality of shame and failure. Um, so in reading this passage from Sedgwick, as I did in, in 2001, alongside Radcliffe Hall's crushingly sad 1928 book, The Well of Loneliness, I sought to imagine a form of queer or backward politics that could recognize shame without necessarily transforming it into pride. What such a backward politics risks, though, is something different. It risks not being a politics at all. That's to say, in pushing back against the premature or too complete transformation of stigma, one might fail to transform it. In that case, one does not reach toward the experimental creative performative force of stigma or even the management of spoiled identity. One is simply left with spoiled identity. 